Fairly often we hear, the time for debate is over. The science is settled. No more need for discussion. It's time for action now. And when we hear it's time for action, what they really mean is that it's time for us to do whatever they tell us without hesitation and without asking questions. What happens if you dare to push back? Well, you'll be canceled. The famous English novelist George Orwell stated, the more society drifts from the truth, the more they will hate those that speak it. Yes, hated and more effectively canceled. Christians don't need to be intimidated by science because true science always confirms the biblical narrative. And most major areas of science were founded by Bible-believing Christians. Just look at this list of scientific disciplines. What has happened to the definition of science? Discovering explanations for the naturalistic world around us has been hijacked to this. Here's a quote from Dr. Scott Todd. Even if all the data point to an intelligent designer, such a hypothesis is excluded from science because it is not naturalistic. Furthermore, science has never been wrong, but scientists have often been wrong, sometimes incredibly wrong. You probably recall how people were taught the sun orbits around the Earth. That belief was completely overturned by later evidence as put forward by Copernicus and Galileo. Another example involves the Earth's tectonic plates. From the inception of modern geology, virtually all secular geologists taught that the plates of the Earth were static. In 1859, Antonio Snyder Pellegrini proposed the plates used to be all together but were torn apart. His idea was mocked and rejected for about 100 years. In the 1960s, secular scientists realized Pellegrini was right, but they had their own spin on it. If the assumptions used to feed data into your system are faulty, you will produce inaccurate results, which will lead to faulty and maybe even dangerous conclusions. Straying from the biblical narrative, our ultimate source of authority leads to all sorts of problems, especially in science. Coming up on today's edition of Origins, The Myth of Settled Science, Part 1, with Jay Siegert. Hello and welcome to Origins. I'm Ray Heipel. It's an honor to be your host today. During this program, we showcase interesting guests who present evidence from science, along with other important facts validating the truth of creation and the accuracy of the Bible. Today's guest, Jay Siegert, is an author and international speaker and holds degrees in both physics and engineering technology. He currently serves as the managing director of the Starting Point Project, which defends the Christian worldview, and he is also the president of Logos Research Associates. Jay has been speaking on the authority of Scripture for over 38 years. Welcome to the program, Jay. It's great to be on the show today. So we've got this interesting topic, settled science. We've all heard the science is settled, right? We hear that more and more and more. <laughs> Time for discussion is over. We just need to listen to what they tell us to do to follow their narrative. It's always settled on their side and on their issues. That, it sort of strikes me that that's the case. Yeah, this is a, a huge topic, and that's one of the first points that I'd make. We can't cover everything, uh, but what my plan will be for this show is we're going to describe the current situation that we're in, yeah. uh, share some general principles, cover a few specific issues in part two, and then uh, generally frustrate you and the audience with all that I don't cover because there are so many things that we could talk about, but this will be a good launching point to get started. All right, well, let's see what we got. Ultimately, this is about Scripture. And do we really, as Christians, 
believe what the Bible says or do we go somewhere else for truth and then bring that as a lens to decide what we're going to believe and what we're not going to believe. But again, with cancel culture and censorship today, the time for debate is over. It's been settled. It's time now for action, meaning the action they want us to do. So no more discussing it. They've, they've done all the hard work for us. They've decided what the truth is. Well, interesting quote from Richard Feynman, American theoretical physicist. I would rather have questions that can't be answered than answers that can't be questioned. Wow, that's a pretty telling statement. Very true. I'm comfortable with not knowing everything, but I'm a little uncomfortable when someone says, you can't question what I'm saying. That's a big red flag. And then from an unknown author, it's easier to fool people than to convince them that they've been fooled. And that's pretty true in my own life. It's not too hard to fool me in things, but to try to tell someone, I know you've heard this, but it's actually not true, gets the response, yeah, you're right, and all the scientists <laughs> are wrong. As if they're all saying whatever that person's view is. Right. Yeah. And it's intimidating. How, yeah. Why would anyone listen to us versus what they're hearing from mm -hmm. all the other scientists? And one of my favorite quotes from Mark Twain, if you don't read the newspapers, you are uninformed. If you do read them, you are misinformed. <laughs> I said that a long time ago, and it's probably more true today than ever with the media uh, and watching and listening to what they have to tell us. So we're going to look at some general information about science to begin with to set the stage here. For many people, science is kind of just out of reach. Uh, they may not be that interested in it. They don't have a background. They don't quite understand everything. And that means they kind of have to sit at the feet and bow at the feet of the scientific magisterium. The experts, whatever they say, you kind of got to go with because they know what they're talking about. And, and a typical person may not have the background to argue with that. But that's okay because scientists are unbiased, right? <laughs> <laughs> We'd like to think that, but uh, it's not necessarily the case. Now, if you're a meteorologist, you have one primary goal, and that is accuracy. <laughs> If you're wrong, everyone's going to know it. And if you're wrong consistently, you're going to lose your job. But it's not necessarily the case with other scientists. You won't necessarily know if what they're telling you that they're seeing is right or wrong. And there's a lot of pressure from money, politics, peer pressure, prestige. All these things can color what they're saying about the data that they're seeing. And way too often, science is political, and it should never be driven by politics, but we see that more and more in society today. The word science, especially biblically speaking, means knowledge, but it doesn't mean wisdom. Hmm. You can be really, really smart, have a lot of facts in your head, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you will be wise. Scripture says in Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and Many scientists don't fear God. A lot of them don't even believe in God. So they might be really intelligent, really smart, but it doesn't mean that they're wise in applying the knowledge that they have. We have all run into that. Then we hear what science says. <laughs> well, guess what? Science says nothing. It doesn't say anything at all. Scientists say stuff. They give their opinions of what they think that they're seeing. So again, science doesn't really speak for itself. Another myth about science is that it's black and white. Scientists are just going into the laboratory. They come out and say, sorry, just, this is what it is. We don't have any other options. It's, it's black and white. We've done the experiments, and you've got to follow the science. We hear that more and more with what they're telling us to do. It's just, sorry, it is what it is. It's black and white. But in reality, science is very colorful, and there's a lot of interpretation that goes on with what they see between that and what they're actually telling us in their conclusions. You know, it's interesting, Jay, in a world where we've been told for generations now that all is relative, there is no absolute truth. I find it intriguing that we do have this voice now that is in effect saying, oh yes, there is truth and we can know it. In fact, you can't even disagree with it. You're not even allowed to question it. Uh, it's, it's sort of funny how that just happened all of a sudden. We went from everything's relative, all opinions are equal, there's no truth, to now this is the truth, and if you don't believe it, you're wrong, and we're going to punish you or cancel you or whatever, as you said. Yeah, it kind of came out of nowhere. The universities used to be a great place to go and discuss and have ideas, but now they've done the 180, and it happened so fast, it made our heads spin, where now you're not allowed to question anything anymore. And they're specifically using science as a club to kind of bully us into submission to do whatever it is they want us to do, and it happens in many ways. We're going to go through each one of these actually pretty quick. 
uh, overly technical. That's where someone's talking to you and they're getting so deep and so technical, you don't even quite understand what they're saying. Well, how can you possibly respond when it's so technical you don't really even understand it? So that's one way that they'll do that. Another one is called elephant hurling. I want to know what that is. Yeah, that sounds kind of fun. Uh, evolution's a fact. Uh, it's been proven by evidence from every area of science. All scientists believe it. These large, vacuous statements that are not backed up by any specifics. It's called elephant hurling. You're just throwing these large elephants out there without specifics to discuss. Appeal to authority. Well, this concept is right because these guys are leading authorities. Well, you know what? They might be world's leading authorities, but that doesn't mean that everything they say is true. So that's appeal to authority. Shaming. If you don't believe what we're saying, you obviously reject science, you're a science denier, and you apparently don't care that people are dying. Yeah. A lot of shame that gets people into submissions, like, well, no, no, I don't, I don't want people to die. What is it you want me to do? I like it when they throw the flat earther comment on you. Well, you're just a flat earther <laughs> if you don't believe what I'm they saying. They tie us into that very, very often. Eliminate discussion. We've already mentioned that. The cancel culture, time for discussion is over. The debate, no, no more. We've already done all the hard work. You need to just do what we're telling you to do now. Consensus science. Well, this concept is true because most scientists believe it. 89%, 95%, whatever they throw out, it must be true. Well, even secular scientists hate this concept of, of consensus science. Truth is not determined by vote or consensus. Often it only takes one fact or one person bucking the system to overturn something that we've taught for years and years and years. So sure, we only have to think of Copernicus or Galileo and exactly uh, how everybody and of course it was the scientists who were opposed to them and were attacking them until eventually the evidence was just overwhelming. That's a perfect example of the whole concept of consensus science. Uh, academic censorship. Well we won't publish your um, articles because you're not real scientists. Well, why are we not real scientists? Because you don't publish in our journals. Why can't we publish in your journals? Because you're not real scientists, and round and round. <laughs> and that actually happens. They just censor, so many creationists have a hard time getting their things published be just because of their belief system, not because of the academic work in the paper. It's just like we won't publish yours because you're a creationist. So that's academic censorship. Then the doggy head tilt. So it's kind of a fun one where somebody says something and it just kind of makes your head tilt. And so <laughs> take a look at that. Uh, this is my daughter's dog, Cooper. Yes, he's cute, and yes, he knows it. Um, but here's an idea or example of the doggy head tilt. They'll say that creation theory is not science because it's not testable. And then they'll turn around and say, we've tested creation theory and proven it to be <laughs> false. Uh, you can't have it both ways. Either it's not testable, then you didn't test it to prove it false, or you tested it, which means it's actually science, but you can't have it both ways. That's one of those things that makes you tilt your head just a little bit. And then lastly, this one's very powerful, misleading headlines. This happens very often. Let's say you see a headline in an article or online that says, recent discovery proves Darwinian ape to man evolution. So nice captive headline, like, wow, they've you got more evidence. The vast majority of people won't even read the article. They'll see the headline. They'll say, more evidence for evolution. When are those Christians going to give up their crazy beliefs in the Bible? Some people will start reading the article, and it'll start out by saying, in 1824, so-and-so, whatever, and they're like, I don't have time for this. I want to know what they just found last week, but I don't have time, so they don't read it. Others will read all the way through casually and just move on. A very small percentage will read all the way through the article, and they get to the end and they say, wait a minute, there's nothing in the article that backs up the headline. In fact, at the end, they said many scientists remain skeptical. But that's maybe a half a percent of the population. The damage has been done. The headline was out there. That's all they needed. It didn't matter what the content of the article was. You know, and that's another example of, as you showed earlier, money driving this. Because if I'm a reporter, the more headlines I get, the more clicks on my headline, rather, that I get, more viewers, more readers. Why? The more money I get, the more, uh, and so that, you know, the, the sensationalizing to, to just make money. Sometimes I don't think it's necessarily, well, they want to, or they believe it, it's just what's the most provocative thing I can say to get more readers. Yeah, very sensational, it grabs your attention. You think you just learned something by reading the headline, but there's really no content behind it. But again, most people will never know that because they won't actually read the articles. 
Well, we'll have to stop right there, Jay. Stay with us. More on settled science right after this. We hope you're enjoying Origins TV. It all started at Cornerstone Television in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We've been producing new episodes for over 37 years now. We praise God for the success of the program and are excited to introduce you to Origins and to us. If you're interested in watching more episodes of Origins, you can find them on our YouTube page. Simply go to YouTube and search Cornerstone Television Network. Click the like and subscribe buttons, then you'll find the best episodes of Origins in our playlist. You can also visit our website at ctvn.org slash origins. One more way you can stay connected with us is to subscribe to our free monthly Hope Today newsletter, which you can do from our website. And if you have any questions, call us here at Cornerstone Television at 888-665-4483. We'd love to connect with you. Thank you for watching. We've been talking with Jay Siegert and we've been looking at the topic of settled science. Jay, it doesn't really seem like the science is all that settled. Not at all. And we were talking about how science is often used as a club to bully us into submission. And this is actually a good exercise in critical thinking. The next time someone is reading an article, watching a video on YouTube, they could look at what they're seeing and ask, how much of what's being claimed is backed up by actual evidence versus that, well, this must be true because most scientists believe it, or this guy's a leading authority, or if you don't believe this, you know, you don't believe in science. You know, these tactics, uh, again, that are used to bully us into submission versus actually having evidence. You know, I found in debating people on social media that if they say science says this or a scientist says this, I can almost immediately just do a search and find scientists who are saying the opposite pretty much on every topic. And I found that when you bring that up, well, your scientists aren't good scientists, or they're not true scientists, or that was from a Russian newspaper, or <laughs> just, you know, crazy things. What do we do when we have all these different voices? I mean, you know, where do we find something concrete that we can hold on to? Sure, and well, things have to be validated by their own content, not who said that, because you have smart people saying things that aren't true. You could have people that maybe aren't that educated making true statements, so things have to be evaluated on their own content. In reality, uh, science is never actually settled. You know, if you think about it, they've told us that eggs are good and then eggs are bad, and then they say aspirin is good and aspirin is bad, and then they say, Chocolate is good. Chocolate is mm -hmm. good. You know, don't fight me on that one. <laughs> don't fight me on that one. You'll lose. My favorite one was growing up because it was butter, and then it was margarine. Oh, yeah, and butter's horrible. Margarine. Then it was butter. Oh no, bar butter's good. It's natural. And then it's margarine again. And now we have like butter that's not margarine, but not butter either. <laughs> and I, I don't even know where to go with this anymore. Yeah, they keep changing their <laughs> minds. So we have to realize that there's a track, you know, history of things changing over time, and that's part of the the essence of science is that we learn new things and so again that's why it's never settled. Now if you want to know which is more dense, lead or cotton, I'm okay with that being settled because you can have many many different scientists whether they're Christians or atheists or anywhere in between do the same experiment, come out with the same results so I don't mind saying that that kind of science is settled but when you're talking about the origin of the universe, origin of life, COVID, climate change, that's a different category and just so we don't leave people hanging, uh, the answer is lead. Lead is more dense than <laughs> cotton. <laughs> You're wondering how dense that I am. But you know, we talk about also you know, when science was wrong. Actually, science has never, ever been wrong. But scientists have been wrong. Things that they claim, statements they make, have been wrong throughout history. And again, it's the nature of science. And, and we have to go back to what you said earlier, that the word science just means knowledge. And if it's actual knowledge, well, then it can't be wrong. If it's misinformation, that's wrong. But real knowledge, you know, God created the heavens and the earth, uh, real knowledge is is it's either knowledge or it's not knowledge, right? right so that's what you mean. And but when you have somebody talking about that knowledge or saying that it's this or that, yeah, it's their interpretation of those facts exactly. can be off. Mm. 
Uh, and one example is the whole idea of something called bloodletting. Uh, doctors used to drain blood out of people's bodies when they got sick. They thought it would cure them, get, get this bad blood out. And that's largely how George Washington died. He got pneumonia, went to the doctor. Oh, he's sick, we gotta get bad blood. They drained some blood. He got sicker. It's like, oh, he's really sick. They drained some more blood. It's like, this guy's really sick. They ended up draining almost a gallon of blood out of him and he died. Now, if they take the Bible seriously, they wouldn't have done that. The life of the flesh is in the blood. Mm. The reason I have a picture of a barber pole up there is you used to be able to go to the barber to have your blood drained, called the bloodletting. So they would go give you a cylinder like that to grasp, mm -hmm. cut your arm, drain some blood, wrap a towel around your arm to stop the bleeding, and sometimes they would take the used towels, hang them on the cylinder, and the wind would catch it and wrap around the poles. That's why today barber poles have red stripes. I did not know that. Is, was there anything like, you know, some sort of uh, factual basis for what they're doing? Are there some conditions if you lose a little bit of blood, you do heal? You could potentially have too much blood, but most of the time you have the right amount and you're not sick because of the blood. It's, you know, something maybe that's in the blood, but you don't want to get rid of the blood. The life of the flesh is in the blood, which Leviticus taught us that a long time ago. So, again, you take the Bible seriously, you would have uh, missed making a mistake like yeah. that. Yeah. Another big one, Ignis Semmelweis, a Hungarian medical doctor in the 1800s. Uh, this was phenomenal. During his time, the mortality rate in European hospitals for women was 25 to 30 percent. What that means is 25 to 30 percent of the women were dying. They were dying when they were giving birth. Now, that's, that's just horrendous. Well, Semmelweis noticed something. As much as we can't imagine this, doctors were going into a room and performing an autopsy. Then they would literally go across the hall and deliver a baby with no preparation in between. Mm -hmm. What he noticed was he thought that was caused a problem. So he started washing with water and chlorine. And in his own practice, he got the mortality rate down to 0.85%. Phenomenal improvement. So, of course, the other doctors said, well, thank you so much for discovering this. This is really going to be a help. No. They said, stop with all the hand washing nonsense. In fact, they locked the guy up in a mental hospital and he was severely beaten by guards when he was trying to escape and he died two weeks later. Now, today we know you need to wash up. We know about germs and bacteria and germ theory, especially with COVID and all that, but this was a mistake they were making. So he didn't realize that the science was settled and they had to imprison him and beat him to the <laughs> point where, you know, they're their science won, but of course, a lot of women died because they didn't allow anyone to question what they were doing. Yeah, they originally all knew it wasn't necessarily, and now they all know it's necessary. Yeah. So it's amazing what, what we know and what we know for sure, right? Right, <laughs> it's kind of dangerous. And then we have mercury. We, uh, we go to a lot of extents to make sure we don't have mercury in our food today, but it used to be used in medicine. We know today now, you know, it could kill somebody, but they used to actually use it in medicine, but they've changed their mind on that, so their interpretation, again, was gravely wrong. And then the whole idea of junk DNA. When scientists were first looking at DNA, it seemed like only 2% of the DNA did anything, coded to make proteins that carry out certain functions in our body. 98% seemed like it wasn't doing anything. So they claimed it was junk, leftover vestiges of evolutionary history, Obviously, we're not designed by God. He wouldn't design you so that 98% of your DNA didn't do anything. Well, they've studied it further. Now they know the 98% they were calling junk, it's more complex than the 2%. It's instructions telling the 2% what to do. Mm. Back to cause one evolutionist to say this, the failure to recognize the implications of the non-coding DNA, that was a portion they were calling junk, that will go down and is the biggest mistake in the history of molecular biology. Big, big mistake, all based on assuming that evolution was true. You know, and it seems like through every one of these examples, really, um, the hubris of men, just because we don't know something, right? We don't know what this DNA is. It doesn't do what, we, what these ones do over here. Therefore, it must be junk. It must have no use. Um, sort of as soon as you sort of rule out the one thing you do know, then we think we know everything, you know, with the washing of the hands or with the mercury. and and. Um, I mean, in man's pride, people are dying when man doesn't humble himself before his creation, before his creator, and say, okay, I don't know what this is, but God made it. It must have a purpose. Right. I ought to be humble and not completely reject 
you know, any possibility of knowing anything. Uh, do you see something similar? And I remember, and, and maybe this is totally unrelated, and you could just say, you know, Ray, you're crazy, but like when my parents were little, they would go and get their tonsils taken out. Like everybody would get their tonsils, because they didn't know that the tonsils did anything. There's, you know, they get sore, they get swollen. When you get a sore throat, better to take them out. Would that be something like that? Yeah, very similar to that. And then the appendix, you know, yank the appendix out. It's not doing anything. It's a leftover organ from earlier stages of evolution. Well, now we know the appendix is part of the immune system. You want to keep it as long as you can. If it goes bad, you might need to remove it, but that doesn't mean it wasn't doing anything. Just like you can get rid of your arms and still function, that doesn't mean they don't have a purpose. And so same thing, removing tonsils, removing the appendices. Um, doctors are very hesitant to do that. Unless it really goes bad, then you might need to, to get rid of that. So in reality, um, it's the myth of settled science. Science is never really settled. There's a lot of room for debate and discussion, and it's really all about interpretation. And if you have a different starting point, like an evolutionary starting point, it often leads to, to wrong conclusions. Jay, it's fascinating stuff. Again, as usual, I hope you can join us again sometime. Thank you. You know, more and more often, Christians, conservatives, or even voices that simply question the mainstream media's current narrative are being attacked with the myth of settled science. In reality, true science is never really settled, and true scientists always question their results. Man is continually learning more and more about God's creation, and it's only as we fear God that we can put what we think we know to good use. It only goes to show you that we know what the Bible says is true, and the proof really is all around you. If you enjoy Origins, we sure could use your help to keep this creation television program on the air. Your support, both prayerfully and financially, make a big impact. Consider what you can do to help Origins continue to bring you excellent programs so that we can work together to reveal how awesome our Creator truly is. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching this edition of Origins. For a DVD of this series, you can order online or send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins Program Number 2209, Cornerstone Network, Wall, Pennsylvania, 15148. This presentation was made possible by the faithful prayers and financial support of you, our Cornerstone family.